Thank you, uh, Reb Shmuley. It's uh, great to be here. Uh, you know, Reb Shmuley exudes warmth, and I can think in particular this time of year coming to a place that exudes warmth. <laughs> valuable, and I particularly appreciate the fact that I heard it was very hot earlier this week. So this is gorgeous, gorgeous weather, and it's wonderful to be here, wonderful to be in such a really warm community. Um, the topic that we're going to look at is one that, um, you know, raises, I think, for many modern people, serious moral questions, ethical questions, which is, how do we uh, do you think about, um, and if we're halachic uh, decisors, how do we rule about, you know, areas in which halacha seems to make distinctions, or makes distinctions, I should say, between Jews and non-Jews. Now, there are obvious areas where it's going to make those distinctions, which I don't think should bother us. You know, issues that relate to ritual matters. Uh, can a non-Jew, a non-Jew can't be a kosher, or somebody to make, to slaughter, you know, an animal to make kosher meat. You know, a non-Jew might not, you know, be able, you know, can't do a, a, a brit milah for my son, you know, a, things of that nature. That doesn't bother us. You know, those are not ethical issues. You know, within our ritual tradition, we want that to be you know, by Jews, for Jews, about Jews, and so on. Um, but when it comes to matters that are about basic ethical questions, you know, we, our, 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 our basic morality in folk tells us that you should not make distinctions between people. So when you're talking about questions like um, uh, stealing, uh, injuring somebody, uh, paying for damaged property, it would, I think for most of us, wouldn't even occur that those laws should make a difference between whether somebody's a Jew or a non-Jew. Um, we have to realize, of course, you know, that not only in halacha, but in, uh, you know, in, in societies for millennia, not all members of the population were always treated the same. Um, uh, so it's not such a surprise that we find these distinctions in Jewish law. Um, and also, if we appreciate the fact that for such a long time Jews were, and not always, uh, but for, in so many situations, Jews were a, an oppressed minority class, uh, and that that would help, that would lead to uh, um, cultivating, you know, or encouraging a perspective on the outside world as hostile, as non-Jews, as evil, or as hostile, and so on. You know, that's something that might that could be expected. Um, so, in terms of one question about how do we think of these, it's how do we think about the fact that these are that these are the laws that are on the books and they're part of our tradition. Um, you know, when we're thinking about like like do we think that the people who codified these laws, weren't they informed by a certain moral sensibility? And there I think we have to be, you know, humble and cautious not to reproject and, you know, and project our sense of, of morality on people in the past. Like, how did everybody in the past not realize how horrific slavery was? You know, it's very easy to be in a privileged position now to be able to, you know, to, 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 to say that, but, but we have to be cautious before we sort of like just cast those types of judgments um, um, uh, <coughs> on the past. And as I said, particularly if we realize the way in which uh, the Jewish, you know, Jews were this unoppressed minority. Um, so I don't, I'm not so bothered with that question. Um, I think we have to raise it. I think we can't gloss over it. I think when we read texts that say, discuss, are you allowed to steal from a non-Jew or not, we have to say, wait a minute. We have to sort of start by acknowledging that this is a problematic text, you know, and that's something that, you know, shouldn't even be a discussion or conversation. I remember that I once came to a, um, a non-Orthodox uh, synagogue to give a talk about this issue. And I dealt with the fact about, like, how do we deal with the fact that, you know, some texts have a whole discussion, are you allowed to steal from a Jew or non -Jew, from a non-Jew, and how do uh, various halachic decisors deal with those texts? And afterwards, I had two sets of people come up to me. I had the parents, you know, sort of that generation, and then I had all the kids who had just come back from a year in Israel. Um, and all the parents said, I am so offended that you even raised that question. Like, how could you even be asking, like, you know, should we be tolerating this type of a difference, or how do we deal with this difference? Like, we shouldn't even, you know, we shouldn't even come up that there could be such a difference even thought about. 
And then I had all the kids who were a year back from Israel. They were saying, I am so offended by the answers you gave. Those were so unacceptable. The law is that there's a difference. I don't want any, like, nice way of making it all the same. So, <laughs> you know, people... <laughs> and I think that is a problem. When, it, you know, when people go to, like, a type of a yeshiva setting, not all yeshiva settings are like this, and these gemarot and these laws are read without being problematized. So it doesn't mean that we have to say that there was, you know, past judgment on the past, but we have to problematize it for us in the present, and that is critical. Um, so that, I would say, is issue number one. You know, to, uh, my approach is not to pass judgment on the past, understand different time, different, different you know, realities that they were dealing with, but to also start by problematizing it for us right now. Um, so the question then becomes, okay, but we have these laws on the books. So if you are a halachic authority, and um, how are you supposed to rule about these cases if they are the laws on the books? Is there a way that if you feel that, that these distinctions should not exist and are against the basic morality, basic human morality, the basic morality of the Torah, the, as we now understand it, you know, and as now our society sort of allows us to operate in a more, uh, you know, society in which we have equal rights and that should be reciprocated, we're not anymore a minority prosecuted class, then what do you do with the fact that that still is the law on the books? Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to look first at some examples of these distinctions. Um, and these are going to be the troubling texts. So it's what called, they call it now, a trigger warning. Okay, <laughs> so you'll see some texts that you might get offended by. Um, and then we're going to talk about, look at examples of how different postkin have tried to bridge that gap and different strategies that they've used to bridge that gap. So the first thing I want to do is, uh, um, distinct, uh, is break this down into three separate categories about these types of laws. One is what I would call um, super erogatory acts. If you take a look at the front page, if we won't look at a source, but if you just look, yep, yeah, look at the headings, at the very first page it says, like, three categories. One in bold is super erogatory. Super erogatory is like extra credit. Okay, things that are not, in by, that you're supposed to do good things to other people, but you're not doing anything wrong by not doing them. We'll get back to that. The other is doing unethical acts when it relates to property, theft, and damaging. And then the other, the final, the most severe, is unethical acts as it relates to another person murder and injury. So let's start with the ethical, with the uh, super erogatory acts. Let's talk about questions about, well, you know what, let me actually pull back and ask, does anybody know um, examples, maybe, in the Torah where it says how we treat, because a lot of these has to do with rabbinic interpretation, how the rabbis interpret words like your friend, your neighbor, does that mean your fellow Jew or does that mean anyone? But there's some places where the Torah is explicit in terms of a different treatment within these types of laws we're talking about between Jews and non-Jews. Does anybody, have anybody heard of anything, think of anything? Ribbit. Right, exactly. Why were the Jews the moneylenders in the Middle Ages? Well, part of the reason was, was because the, the church, for whatever reason, decided to adopt also the rule of not lending with interest to fellow Christians. So the only way, Christians couldn't lend with interest to fellow Christians. So the only way, went, and so who was going to lend money if you can't charge interest? So the only way that people were able to borrow with interest was to borrow from Jews. That's how the Jews became the moneylenders, also because Jews couldn't own property. Um, so they were sort of forced into that position. Um, so the Torah actually says to the, to the, to the foreigner, lanachri, you can lend with interest, but to your fellow Jew, you cannot lend with interest. The Torah explicitly makes that difference. Okay? And another a good example would be the question about uh, giving charity. You know, it says when one of your brethren from one of your cities comes to you, you know, you should open up your heart, you should lend them money, you should give them money, and so on. And from the context, it seems very, very much it's talking about um, a fellow Jew. So let me ask you that question. Does it bother you that we have a primary mitzvah to give tzedakah to Jews and not an equal obligation to give to Jews and non-Jews? Does it bother anybody here? No. It doesn't bother me. It bothers you? Well, <laughs> Somebody I'm, who is not affected by peer pressure. Excellent. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm more, uh, this is part of a, a larger issue, mm -hmm. and that is, what does it mean to be the chosen people? Right. Uh, or, does that mean we have extra rewards? Right. Or, as I understood it, extra obligations? Right. 
And if it's extra obligations and we're supposed to be a model, right. that would that would seem to me to be go against this. Okay, so you are right. You know, if you think that it's extra obligations, the question is the idea of chosenness, if that means extra obligations, how can we privilege our fellow Jews? But I would actually say it doesn't bother me, not because Jews are better. It doesn't bother me because I actually think it's a good model. And the model is the model is the same principle that's adopted by the um, I think this is the is the environmental uh, Somebody will remind me whose model this is, but it's think globally, act locally. Who is that? That's environmentalist. Uh, yeah, think globally, act locally, which means we have limited resources, we have limited money, time, effort. You have to prioritize. Are you going to worry about the whole world's problems, or are you going to worry about your local problems? Now you should, to some degree, worry about the whole world problems, or else you become just completely, you know, self-centered, and the only thing that matters are those that are closest to you. Right? So you have to be concerned and thinking about it and doing something about the larger problems. But, it, but your efforts are all going to be like diffused if you worry about trying to solve the world. You know, if everybody, you worry about your local community, your local community takes care of itself, and that actually, if everybody is doing that, right, then we're all getting better. And there's been so much in terms of how Jews have been able, like, you know, with Jewish immigrants because they had free loan societies and because they felt this inner, you know, this connection for fellow Jews, they were actually, it did a tremendous amount to help elevate the whole community. And I think it's a model that every community should act that way. So that doesn't bother me to say that we prioritize those that are closest to us. What bothers me is when it's uh, interpreted, you know, by some as we only care about those that are closest to us. And I think that's the real concern. So what I often tell people is, look, you know, you, I'm not telling you how much you should give to more global causes when you're figuring out, you know, your tzedakah allocations. But I am going to tell you one thing. It shouldn't be zero, okay? <laughs> like, if you want to give 90% of your tzedakah or 95% of it to Jewish causes, you know, fine, 100%, but give 5% of it, you know, to the local hospital or, you know, the local homeless shelter or some global issue that has caught your attention. So you are telling yourself that I am not only a citizen, like a, a Jewish person, I'm a citizen of the world, I'm connected to the world, I have responsibilities towards larger humanity. So in terms of the issue of prioritizing, you know, fellow Jews in terms of what I'm calling super erogatory acts, like doing good deeds, right, um, that does not bother me, as I said. Uh, as long as it's just prioritizing, it's not exclusive. Um, I do want to say something about the money lending. What do you think? Is lending with interest, like, is that doing something bad? Lending people charging interest when you lend money? We're doing something bad to a non Jew when we, if we lend them money with interest? No, right? Because if I can rent you my apartment and charge you rent, and rent you my car and charge you rent, I can lend you my money and charge you rent, right? I'm not getting use of that money. It's completely natural to be able to charge rent. Lending money without interest is the stupidest thing ever because <laughs> the best case scenario is that you break even, right? The worst case scenario, and you break even and you didn't have use of that money. That's the best. The worst case scenario is the guy defaults on the loan and you never see the money again. So lending money without interest is really a form of tzedakah. Um, and actually, this is a separate uh, lecture that I give, but actually, the Torah much more explicitly talks about an obligation to lend without interest than it does to give charity, just to give a gift. Because lending incur you know, helps preserve somebody's dignity in a way that giving charity doesn't, and there's a lot that can be gained by a structure of lending without interest, and then allowing loans that have been defaulted to be forgiven every seven years. That's really the Torah structure. So anyway, so that category, making those distinctions, does not really bother. Me. What, 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 if, um, what if it's made public? Like, let's say a case like this. Someone died, they're on their deathbed, and they say, I will donate my organs right. um, to a Jew. Right. So now the medical staff gets an order, you know, this person only wants their organs to go to a Jew. Does right. the public nature of it affect it? Yeah, I mean, look, that raises important questions yeah. because, you know, there's a principle called, which we'll see later on, called Chil Hashem, right, a desecration of God, the divine name. And, you know, sometimes the context sends the message that only Jewish lives matter, non-Jewish lives don't matter. Right? So I think you have to be sensitive to what messages you're sending yourself and you're sending to other people. So I think yeah. that that is a factor. 
All right, so now let's talk, though. So those, that's the first section. We're not even going to read those sources inside. We're going to go ahead and look at some of the more difficult ones, issues relating to other people's property. Okay, so let's take a look here at source number four. Source number four is from Rambam, and he says, There is no prohibition of overcharging a non-Jew. As it says, do not overcharge one man his brother. And brothers understood by the rabbis, meaning as fellow Jews. So a lot of this is how the rabbis read words like brother and fellow and so on. Now, overcharging, I should say, um, does, means, and according to halacha, it doesn't mean that you're limited in terms of what profit you can make. You know, you can make whatever profit the market will bear. What it means, though, is that you're charging more than the going rate. Or if there's a range of the going rate, you know, so then, you know, uh, then you're charging beyond that range, and the person is unaware of that, so you're taking advantage of it. Does Somebody that knows cheating? what? Does that include cheating? Yeah, I mean, cheating is a slightly different prohibition, but it's, we'll get to cheating in a minute, okay? So slight cheating is a little different, we'll get to that. Um, so, you know, if I know that, like, because I'm stopping off at the side of the highway, a cold Coke is going to cost me $3, but in my supermarket it costs me 50 cents, that's not overcharging because I know how much it goes for and that's the going, you know, that's the going rate. But if I'm not aware what the cost is and I'm being charged more than the going rate, that's a problem. And here it says, oh, but for a non-Jew you're allowed to do it. I mean, that's a very dangerous text, right? It feeds in to, like, negative stereotypes about Jews and so on. Um, here's another one, which is even uh, more disturbing. Right? I don't know if you could decide which one is more disturbing. It says like this, the Gezel HaGoy Mishari, is it really, because based on an earlier discussion, it sounded like somebody in the Gemara was saying that it's permissible to steal from a non-Jew, and the Gemara raises the question, is it really permissible to steal from a non-Jew? Now, I want to pause for a second, because if you are looking in the Hebrew, you'll see that there's some words in parentheses and some in brackets. Here, I, I want to tell you a fascinating thing about these texts. If you asked a stand, a, a, your, your, your regular person who went to yeshiva and said, what is the term in the Talmud for a non-Jew? Um, does anybody know what the standard Talmudic term is for a non-Q? No, no that's, you, you're sort of right. That's the right, right answer, but it's not the answer you would normally get. The normal answer you would get Gare. is Gare. what? Gare. Gare is a convert or a spanker. No, the normal ans- word in the Gemara, that sort of in the yeshiva world that we're familiar with, is akum. Has anybody ever heard of akum? You haven't heard of it? Akum is an abbreviation, which means oved kochavimu mazalot, which basically means a star worshiper. That is the word that you will see all the time in the Talmud to refer to a non-Jew. But the, 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 the point that it's nochri, nochri or goy, is the real right answer. So why do you see all the time this word aku? Because here's what happened. In the Middle Ages, uh, as you might know, some Jews converted to Christianity because of, you know, for social reasons, financial reasons, whatever, they didn't want to be the oppressed minority class. They converted to Christianity, and some of them were quite learned. And some of them went to the church and said, I, I want to tell you what's in that Talmud. And they told all of these things, some of them are these laws, some of them are just sort of attitudes that are expressed in the Gemara, that says all these nasty things about non-Jews. They're saying this about you. And that led to, anybody know what that led to? The the burning of the Talmud, you know, in some places, the forbidding of it to be published, the burning of the Talmud, or the church censoring the Talmud. So what the Jewish community did was they basically said, we are going to fix this problem ourselves. And they went through every single time it says goy or nachri, which, which are innocuous terms, I mean, they just mean Gentile, foreigner, and they changed it to say akum. So that allowed them to say to the church that oh, this isn't referring to you. We love you guys. We're not talking about normal non-Jews. We're just talking about those ancient pagans and star worshippers. None of this text ever was meant to refer to you. And by doing that, they sort of say, you know, allow the Talmud to not get burned and censored. Now, you know that a text is really problematic if it doesn't even use the word akum, and it uses an, even another word to even make a greater distancing. So in the discussion in the Talmud, of are you allowed to steal from a non-Jew, the original text said, is gezel goy, stealing from a goy permissible? But the text that appears in our Talmud is, is gezel knani permissible, is stealing from a Canaanite permissible? 
people. <laughs> so you don't think, so the, the, you know, it's almost like an awareness that we can't even say this was ever discussed even about pagans. We have to put it like 2,000 years even before that and say that this was a question that was discussed about those ancient Canaanites. All right, so anyway, so there was, it's interesting to see that this process of like seeing, you, you know, your own discourse through the eyes of others and becoming sort of aware of how it looks and leading to this type of a, of a, of a sensory is already the beginning of an awareness of what's, go, you know, what's going on in these texts. Um, so here's what the Gemara says. All right, let's read this in the English, okay? Is the robbery of a non Jew permissible? Has it not been taught that Rabbi Simeon, Rabbi Shimon stated that, that the following matter is expounded by Rabbi Akiva when he arrived from Zifrin, its place? Whence can we learn that robbery of an Andrew is forbidden from the words, and he that is sold may be redeemed again? Which implies that he could not withdraw and leave it. Okay, so this gets into a very technical discussion of the text. Okay, we're going to skip some of this, but I'm going to skip to the next paragraph. So the Gemara says, you know what, you're not allowed to steal from an Andrew. It recognizes that there's a position that you are, but I would say, thankfully, from our perspective, it concludes you're not allowed to steal from an Anju. But it doesn't end there, because then it says, Rava therefore says, there's no difficulty. As regarding robbery, there's no exception. Whereas regarding the cancellation of debts, this is permitted. Meaning, I can't actually break into a non-Jew's house and take their money or, you know, pick his pocket and take money from him or whatever. But if he says to me, where's that $100 you owe me? And I say, oh, I already paid you up, so I'm not really actively taking money from him. I'm just not paying him what I owe him. Well, then that's permissible. Okay, and that's really disturbing, right? Um, and, you know, I, I am sorry to say that some people who are not looking to address the moral problematics of, the, of these texts, but are actually looking for, to allow them, you know, for, for halacha to allow them to do things that are immoral, will actually say, oh, so then you're just allowed to cheat on your taxes. Because not paying your taxes is not active stealing, it's just, you know, not paying what you owe, right? So that type of, that, that is a possible discourse because of a Gemara, because of this Gemara. Okay, and then the Gemara goes on with those types of issues. All right, so here is, that's a small sampling. Uh, you know, for limited time, obviously, as Rabbi Rosh Shmuley said, we're not going to look at all these cases. There's other cases about if your animal gores another, an ox of a non-Jew that you don't have to make restitution. So there's these examples that while you're not allowed to actively steal from an non-Jew, you're also not, you also, is not such a concern about not paying debts or paying what you owe or somehow, or similar. However, I will say one paragraph to read is, the se- go down to the second paragraph after the one we were reading. It was taught, and this gets to the point that Rashmuli was asking, Rav Pinchas ben Yar said, where there was a danger of causing a profanation of the name, Hilul Hashem, even retaining, even the retaining of a lost object of non-Jew is a crime. Then you even have to return their lost object. So, you know, when, when, when money is a factor, everybody convinces themselves that, oh, nobody's ever going to find out. It will never lead to a chil Hashem. You know, it's not like we've ever read in the front page of the newspapers about this ever <laughs> happening, you know. So, you know, hopefully, even for people that might feel like, oh, okay, it's okay, here's a way I can get away with it. You know, I wish people were at least, you know, more seriously concerned about chil Hashem and what happens when it becomes public. But really, I want people to be concerned about the basic morality of it and dealing with the fact that this, te- that this text leaves open that window. Yes? In, in this context, um, the return of a lost article is an article, and the other issues are of money. So uh, retaining someone's article would be something that would be a public, um, could be a publication of what you've done versus using their money as a fund. No, loss. the lost article means I'm walking on the street and I find a wallet and it has $1,000 in it, and it's got a driver's license of, like, you know, Chris, Chris, Chris Christopherson or something like this, you know, so a certain non Jew. Nobody saw me pick it up, so I'll take the $1,000 out of the wallet, and I'll just walk and leave, leave the wallet behind. That's the case it's talking about. Okay. It seems like it'd be, like, buying public? someone's shirt and then oh. wearing his shirt. No, if it's public, then that gets to the issue of the desecration of the name problem. But it's imagining situations where that where it's possible it wouldn't be. That's what the Gemara is saying. If there's a concern of the public nature of it, then obviously you have to, you know, return the object. But so, in that case, it would only be an object, and it wouldn't be money. It seems to be in the translation. No, I think what I think what it's, I think I don't want to belabor this. I think the point it's saying is is that if we had to rank how bad it was, active stealing is the worst. 
<laughs> Lying about money owed is second worst, and not returning a lost object is the least bad. So it's saying when there's a concern about it being public and the des- and chil Hashem, then even the returning of a lost object you have to do. Okay, that's the point. But you know, anyway, I can talk to you more about it after. Uh, yeah. Based on the Talmudic position that you can't even do business with idolaters, mm-hmm. is there any intersection there with this that would go even further to say you cannot? Do something to benefit them? Not that you may not return it or you may steal, but you may not do something that benefits them, and well, thus you should not even? Well, uh, the Gemara about doing business, it's, it's more, very specific about entering into partnership, because in, um, in that world, the way you would you know, make sure that your partner was being honest was that if you had any doubts, you would make them take an oath in the name of their God that they didn't cheat you. Mm-hmm. And for the Talmud, you don't want to be have to have a pagan take an oath in the name of their pagan God in order to va- you know, verify what they're saying is true. So it was a very local concern. Um, you know, um, here and there you have this issue about, like, you know, is it a problem of, of, of giving money to non-Jews? But that's much less of an issue. Mm-hmm. All right, anyway, um, so these are some of the things relating to property. Uh, then it gets, at least, stealing isn't okay, but, you know, other things, the door is left open. Um, then we get to the even harsher thing. So let's look at source number eight. Okay, here's Maimonides in Laws of Murder. And he says, whoever murders a Jewish person transgresses a negative commandment. As it is said, thou shalt not murder. See any problem with that text? <laughs> <laughs> One word. Well, except it doesn't specify... Murder your brethren. Right. Well, first of all, the biblical text it's based on is I mean, talk about like an absolute type of a categorical, uh, you know, directive: "Thou shalt not murder," which doesn't even say your your neighbor or anything. So, a, it's how you know the text it's based on seems very absolute. And the bottom line to say what it's not murder if you kill a non-Jew. I mean, you know, how, how are you supposed to say such a thing? Actually, recently it was about ten years ago in a uh, very well-known um, Orthodox rabbinical school that has a Torah publication every year that the students write, a student did a whole uh, discussion of what exactly is the prohibition about killing a non-Jew. And he looked at all the different positions. Is it murder, but you don't get the death penalty for it, or is it only is it biblically forbidden or only rabbinically forbidden? And they went to this whole discussion without it once problematizing the fact that we could even be talking about this, you know? So, I mean, that was like, you know, just a way that somehow we get so caught up in the internal dialogue, and not we, but like often in the, you know, in the yeshiva world, that it's a real issue, okay? So, um, so one is, you know, it doesn't say it's permissible, but it's, for me, deeply disturbing to say it's not included in thou shalt not murder. Um, and now let's look at source number 10, which has to do with, um, something that, you know, hopefully nobody's going around ruling, oh, it's not a big deal, you know, chas or something, you know, God forbid somebody would say such a thing about that, about somebody's life, you know, if you actually, you know, did violence to another person. Um, but if you want to know where some people, some, like, rabbinic authorities are saying things that, uh, in, as practical rulings, let's take a look at source number 10. And here's what the mission says. It says the following. <laughs> Every danger to human life suspends the laws of Shabbos. That's pikuach nefesh. If there's an issue about saving a person's life, it overrides Shabbat. That is a very major principle, the value of human life. You know, it, 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 it trumps everything else. Um, if debris falls on someone, so now let's say somebody's in a building and the building collapsed on Shabbat. So can you, you know, uncover, move all the stones in order to save the person who might be at the bot, who's at the bottom, and maybe you'll be able to save their lives. So it says, it's doubtful whether he's there or whether he's not there. You know, you don't even know, was he in the building when it collapsed? Whether he's alive or dead, and maybe he's already dead. Or whether he be an Israelite or a non-Jew, you don't know any of these things. So... You know, and maybe I shouldn't bother saving him because maybe he's already dead. Maybe he wasn't there. Maybe it was a non-Jew who was in the building. No, nevertheless, you should uncover on Shabbat for for his sake because even if it's only like you know far, it's only a, a sliver of a chance that you might be able to save a life. He would have to have been there, and he would have to still be alive, and I would have to be Jewish. You know, nevertheless, even though there's all those ifs, you still go ahead and break Shabbat because maybe you can save a life. Obviously, what implicitly emerges from this is, is that if you knew he was not Jewish, you would not violate Shabbat. Now, 
We will see in a minute how Rav Moshe Feinstein basically <coughs> made that ruling move. Okay, and that's the second part of this, is to see how Postkin, who recognized the problem with this gap, try to close the gap. But I want to, but I want to end this section by, by here having a little uh, newspaper article from uh, 2012. Rabbi Yosef, this is Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, people might have heard of him, previous chief rabbi of Israel. Treating Gentiles violates Shabbat. Shas leader says religious physicians cannot violate Shabbat in order to save Gentiles' lives, but offers a halachic solution to avoid legal repercussions. So he says, so let's read this. What should a religious doctor do if a Gentile is injured in a car accident on Shabbat and is rushed to the hospital? According to Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, this does not warrant violating the sanctity of the Shabbat. During a class on, Shab- on, on, Sa- on Shab- Sabbath halacha relating to religious physicians, the spiritual leader of Shas said that while doctors are expected to do everything in their power, even if is violating Shabbat to save the Jews whose lives are in danger, the same does not apply for Gentiles. And then he goes on and on. So now what are you supposed to do with it? He says the following. Um, so let's skip to the next column. Rabbi Yosef expounded on the problem, saying that the Mishnah Brura, a classic authority, says that all religious physicians who treat Gentiles on Sabbath are viola- uh, uh, who treat Gentiles on the, the Sabbath, that should be, I guess, are violating the Sabbath. However, in reality, patients are brought to the hospital and must be treated. The doctor's license says they must treat all patients without distinction of faith or race. So, what's the poor doctor to do? <laughs> Not what's about the poor person who's dying? <laughs> what's the poor doctor supposed to do? He's gonna get. He's gonna lose his license. So he says the rabbi offered a halachic solution. Follows the rule which a single person is doing the act. He's violating the Sabbath. Well, if two people are doing it together, they're exempt. So here's what you do: the doctor who needs to operate will call on another doctor or nurse to hold the scalp together and make the incision, says Rabbi Yosef. It's necessary for all religious physicians to refrain from being put on trial for distinguishing between a Jew and a Gentile on Sabbath. So we don't want the, the doctor to be prosecuted, you know, or to have to stand trial, so here's how you're going to do it. So, you know, as you can see, it's deeply disturbing that it's not even coming from a concern for the life of the non-Jew, and the solution seems, one wonders if anybody can reasonably operate by having two people hold the scalpel at the same time. So this is the problem, okay? This is the problem that emerges. And some post-skin are not interested in solving the problem where they don't see it as a problem, you know? Um, But as I said, I think that we very much feel that it is. So what has been done by those halakhic authorities who also feel that that's a problem and think that as part of their responsibility as halakhic authorities, you know, it means, uh, Rabbi Yankowitz and I was talking about this beforehand, that, um, that... that the whole concept of Torah Shabal Peh, which is, means the oral law, so sometimes that's explained as an idea of like, oh, the, you have all these traditions that were passed on. But what the oral law really is more, in a more meaningful way, is that God basically is a, says, I'm giving you the Torah, I'm giving you this law, you are going to be partners with me in this law in interpreting it and implying it, explaining what it means. And the responsibility of a rabbi, of a posseg, is to have fidelity to the text and the tradition, but also bring a deep understanding of the values of the Torah and what are <clears throat> those deepest values and, and, and see how they can realize them you know, in this world, bringing the, these laws in this world true to those values of the Torah and true to the tradition in the fullest way. Um, and there, that's what I think a number of postgames are coming and saying, like, this might be the law on the books, but we have a sense that sort of morality is dictating something else, and that morality is anchored in the, our deep understanding of the Torah and God's values, and we have to see how we can bridge that gap. Yes? What is the obligation, of, for example, the example you gave of the Jewish doctor? Yeah. What is the obligation of that Jewish doctor not to commit to work on that day right. when he can't treat his patients. Right. So that is a question that the, <coughs> the post can deal with, right? Which is, like, maybe you, like you, you, some say you need to try to avoid working on Shabbat, you know, so you minimize the violation. Others say, like, you know, no, I mean, you know, you're saving lives, so you don't... But work. you're not saving lives if you refuse to... Oh, in the case of the non-Jew. Correct. Oh, so that's an interesting question, meaning what if you said to a value safe, you know... 
why don't we, you know, you should be just advising religious doctors to not work on Shabbat if you think it's such a problem. That's correct. That's an interesting question. I, I don't think know it's a what, problem if right. you think about Maimonides yeah. in, in Brooklyn. I mean, right. the doctors, that was a problem. Was it? That they, yes. what, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, uh, well, they wouldn't they treat non-Jews? Wouldn't, no. No, but there were certain things that they wouldn't do on Shabbos. Oh, like right, but they right, right asked, nose or something. Right, but they asked other Jews. Oh, really? To, to oh, do that's do a that. problem. They're asking other Jews to do that. Right. that I, yeah, I, I don't know who gave them that ruling or if they were acting on their own. That is a real problem. Okay. Okay. So anyway, so here is this issue about okay. those that feel that they have this responsibility to close this gap. And how are they going to do it? I want to tell, uh, answer, take the question in a second. I want to just tell a brief story that very much touches on this about, uh, about Rav Soloveitchik. So there was a story, to, I, I, I think about 30 years ago. I'm probably getting the dates a little wrong. Maybe it was even more. Um, there was a story in Israel in the newspapers about how uh, somebody, a, a non-Jew, maybe it was an Arab, was, uh, you know, uh, something happened on Shabbat and the Jewish doctors didn't treat him, or like the people at, on the scene, maybe, they, you know, the rescue, the first responders didn't help him, and it was like this huge uh, scandal and embarrassment in all the papers. I think it turned out that actually it was like, it was, it, it, it was a lie, that it didn't actually happen, that the person was just, you know, muckraking or whatever, but regardless, that was like the big story. And then all of a sudden, all the rabbis were discussing, like, oh, so, so what's the halacha? How do you, you know, it was almost like, it was clear, you know, morally and also, you know, from the outcry, you had to articulate, like, what does halacha say about this? So, apparently, this reached America, and I heard this from somebody who was in Rav Soloveitchik's class, from Rabbi, uh, from, from, uh, from, from Rabbi Saul Berman, and in Rav Soloveitchik's class, you know, the students came and they said to him, so what's the story? Are you allowed to save the life of a non-Jew on Shabbos? And he said, yes. So they said, yes, but what about what the Gemara says? So he says, well, worry about the Gemara later, but I'm telling you the halach is yes. You're allowed to say it, which is like, I know from my deep sense of, you know, of, of what the Torah is about, and the, you know, in the deep sense that the Torah speaks with a you know, profound moral and ethical voice, that the answer has to be yes. I don't know yet how I'm going to fit that into the Gemara, you know, how I'm going to reconcile that with what the Gemara seems to be saying, but, I, but, but that's my starting point. Um, and I think that that's where, you know, without maybe articulating it exactly that way, some of what we're going to see now, some of the halachic authorities were working with that sense and how they sort of work to close the gap. You had your hand up before? Uh, you have to pass the right rabbi. I'm curious about, like, our sensibilities, the uh, concept of pikuach nefesh, mm -hmm. the idea that your life takes precedence historically, right. was that... Uh, not necessarily nefesh meant a Jewish person? Well, that's what these texts are saying. Now... Well, How this actually point. played out historically is a good question. You know, um, I know somebody who claims that nev it was ne nobody ever really acted upon, like you know, just from the reality of Jews living amongst non-Jews and so on. You know, that they that they don't that they believe that uh, that it was that in practice nobody ever acted according to that halacha. You know, but um, I, I don't think that's so. But what about risking your life to save someone? Oh, oh you, have an, uh, you have an obligation to risk your life to save someone? Yeah, the general assumption is that you don't. Um, you know, that, um, but there's a whole question about, let's say, risking a limb to save a life. I mean, these are, like, that's like a separate lecture. Oh, that's that, 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 kind of Yeah, exactly. You know, those are... But does it differ if it's a Jew or not Jew that's being saved? Okay. Well, according to the basic halacha here, in the original sources... You know, you don't have to really put, I mean, it's not just on Shabbat, there's other sources that I didn't quote that basically you don't really have to put yourself out to save the life of a non-Jew almost altogether. So, I mean, the, the, even, you know, not only on Shabbat. I remember I once gave this lecture and somebody came up to me and said, Rabbi, before you talk <clears> about the texts that say you can't save the life of a non-Jew on Shabbos, you have to talk about the texts that say you can't save the life of a non-Jew on Wednesday. You know, and <laughs> now those texts are more clearly talking about idolaters than about any non-Jew, but nevertheless, it's, yeah. So the, in terms of the texts, it seems like Jews could be doing very little to be help, to helping the lives of non-Jews, you know, when they're in danger. Um, at least those texts, there are other texts which we're about to see. Um, in practice, it played out, I, I don't think it played out exactly that way. Yes? Couldn't you assume naturally just good intent by the patient? I mean, if the patient doesn't reveal that they're not right. Jewish... Right. You can assume by good intent, well, maybe they are Jewish. You yeah, so that's a way of, so what you're already getting at is a way of bridging the gap. 
Let's mm -hmm. try to operate in some sense of you know, vague facts to allow ourselves to do it. So, mm -hmm. that, that, so what, that's already a strategy of, okay, there's a problem, but let's figure out how we can minimize it. So right. that's exactly what we're going to see. So let's turn now to exactly looking at some, some of these strategies. Now, the way I've organized the rest of these sources is according to what I sort of see as the, what I'll call the legal strategies of minimizing the distinctions. So number one here on page four is by citing other obligations. Now, this it sort of goes to this question about mentioned before about caring for non-Jews, their person, their property, that saying, you know what, maybe some of these laws create this gap, but there are other things that come in and step in and fill this gap. This mostly works around areas where it's a question about the first category of do we have to do good deeds you know, towards others. Um, and the biggest one here that's cited is something that's referred to as Darche Shalom, ways of peace. Um, and let's read this source together, okay? This is source number 12. And it says the following. From, this is a Tosefta. This is from the uh, sort of second century period. In a town that has both Jews and non-Jews, those who oversee the charity collection should, co should collect both from the Jews and from the non-Jews because of ways of peace. Um, and we distribute the funds to poor non-Jews alongside the poor Jews because of ways of peace. We eulogize and bury dead non-Jews because of ways of peace. Um, and we console non-Jewish mourners because of ways of peace. Darchei Shalom, ways of peace. Now, what does Darchei Shalom mean? It is sometimes interpreted, and some, now some people assume that this is the default meaning of it, in a very, um, um, I would say, like, self... Uh, 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 almost cynical way or maybe enlightened self-interest I'll call it which is we should be nice to them why? so or because then they'll be nice to us so then they'll be nice to us okay enlightened self-interest so we do we live among them we gotta be nice because if we're nice to them they'll be nice to us so, look, it gets the job done. It's telling us to be nice to them. Um, so it's a little bit filling that gap. You know, and here are the types of things, like giving them charity, burying their dead, consoling their murder, all of these types of good deeds. But it's not speaking to a deeper value. And there are other ways to read this idea of ways of peace. Um, I, you know, I, there was somebody... Um, uh, um, I'm trying to remember who was, but anyway, a certain law professor who was also involved in the, like, um, you know, in halacha, said to me, what if we just reverse the order of that statement? As opposed to, um, we should be nice to them so that they should be nice to us. Let's say you reversed it and said, because they are nice to us, we should be nice to them. Then it switches it from being about self-interest and it changes it to being about reciprocity. Right? Because we are beneficiaries from the larger world in which we live, you know, I mean, we, uh, you know, by the roads and by the clean air and by the mail system and by everything that we are provided for, you know, and this was even true when Jews lived amongst hostile non-Jews. They still benefited to some degree from the larger world that was created by, you know, by the non-Jews. So because they're nice to us, we have to be nice to them. That creates certain moral obligations upon us. It changes it pretty radically if you think about it that way. I'll say another way of saying it, which is, think about, there's some very bizarre line in this passage we read that doesn't immediately fit to this idea about being nice to them. Do you, can you see it among the list of things that we read about ways of peace, this source number 12? Which one of the ones mentioned is not exactly about doing nice things to them? Collecting their money. Collecting their money. What does that mean that we are supposed to collect charity from them because of ways of peace? What do you think that means? <coughs> oh, that's so nice of you. You're coming and, uh, and, and taking my money. <laughs> yes? It's expensive if someone wants to help the poor and we're not, we're not letting them know we can't take your money. Right. So what does taking their money mean? What, what does it communicate? It's a communal... Correct. It communicates that you're part of our community. We're intertwined, right? When you actually have somebody say, we're coming to you to help give... You know, I mean, it's one thing to force them to give, but to say, we'd like you to give, it's just saying, like, okay, we're seeing ourselves as all part of a, of a shared community. But aren't there yeah. obligations to give when you're asked for charity? Yes, but halakhic obligations, they don't apply to the non-Jews. But there's halakhic obligations to the charity collectors to collect. 
Yes. Just wring it out of people. Uh, okay, that's a separate discussion, but that's for Jews. Okay, here we're talking about for the way they're relating to the non-Jews. I'll tell you a story, which is, you know, when I just got married, we got, you know, we had a lot of people at the wedding, and we got a gift, my wife and I, from this woman who literally had nothing. And, um, and uh, she, you know, she bought us, like, I think some, like, from the dollar store, something that maybe cost $5, like, you know, one of those, you know, the plastic ladle and the fork and the spoon set or whatever. And I said to my wife, I said, like, you know, she needs this $5 that it cost, like, I wasn't offended. I said, she needs this money more than us. I wish you wouldn't have given us this gift. I wish you just would have kept it. And, and my wife's grandfather, Oliver Shalom, was very wise. He says, he says, no, he says, you know, this makes her feel that she is an active, meaningful member of a community, right? To go to a wedding and not give a gift. Like, you, you, people don't want to be like a nebuch. You don't want, you know, to be able to, to give means that you matter and means that you are actually part of the community. Um, so I think that Darche Shalom is not just be nice so they'll be nice. Darche Shalom is we're all in this together. Right? And you want, we want to work peacefully and productively together. It recognizes the sense that even while we live in our own little sub-communities, there's a larger community that holds us all. So I actually think that this is a powerful text. Um, and, you know, you put it side by side by other texts that speak about, are you allowed to steal from them? How can you both steal from them and say, dar you know, so if you give more weight to this text, it obviously sort of really pushes the other sort of things aside. Um, one other way to appreciate what the meaning of Darche Shala means is in Rambam. That's source number 14. Let's take a look at that. So he says the following. He says, it would appear towards me, and people see this, source 14 on page 5, it would appear to me that we act towards the resident alien. Okay, that's like a non-Jew who basically is living among us and keeping a lot of the laws with courtesy and acts of loving kindness as we do with a Jew because we're commanded to sustain their lives, etc. Okay, and then he says, skip to the next paragraph, even regarding the non-Jew, our sages have commanded us to visit their sick and to bury their dead alongside the Jewish dead and to feed their poor amongst the Jewish poor because of ways of peace. Behold, the verse says, God is good to all, and his compassion is on all his creatures. And it says, her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all of its paths are peace. So Ramam rarely quotes verses, especially verses that aren't quoted in the Talmud. Here he is quoting this verse to give meaning to the idea of ways of peace. Do you see how Rambam is interpreting what ways of peace means? He says, the verse says, the Torah's ways are ways of pleasantness, and all of its paths are peace. So ways of peace is what? The ways of the Torah. The Torah is about shalom, is about peace. So to do something because of the ways of peace means to follow the values, to follow the deep morality that is at the heart of the Torah. That is what Ram is saying. It might not be a technical halachic requirement, but if the Torah's ways are ways of peace, we are also should be living our lives in accordance with those values. So that's another very powerful way of thinking of it. So on the one hand, you have technical law. Legally, we might not be required to do certain things. Legally, we might even be allowed to do certain types of acts of injury or not paying of debts. But then you have these moral obligations or Torah obligations in terms of Torah values, in terms of what it means to be reciprocity, a shared community, living a life informed by the values of the Torah, which come to really fill the gaps and counterbalance a lot of that. Yes? How, how would you contrast Derek Eretz and Derek Shalom? Derek Eretz is more, I mean, Derek Eretz means a lot of things in different contexts. And Sometimes it means making a living. Um, but Derek Eretz is more about like, um, like menschlichkeit and politeness and mm -hmm. courtesy, you know, interacting with people nicely. Um, if There's somebody, if, if I'm not giving a poor person you know, charity, it's not a problem of derech eretz. It's a problem about meeting miserly. It's a problem, you know, derech eretz has more to do with like ways you, uh, like I said, courtesy and respectful interaction and menschlichkeit. It's a different type of a concept. Um, okay, so that's one idea. Now, sadly though, for some people, this idea about like the, the Torah's values, you know, and these moral values carries a lot of weight. You know, um, some people maybe it even carries more weight than halacha, 
But for a certain community, for a halacha community, sadly, sometimes people will sort of say, oh, so it's not really matter because it's not a real technical halacha. It's just a moral principle. You know, so <laughs> sadly, that is how... So now, I, I don't, you know... Thankfully, many people won't respond that way. But there are some people who will. And, um, and it's important, therefore, to see how the postkin came to deal with this even at a technical halachic level. And we've already seen some suggestions. So let's take a look here at, I'm going to skip some of this um, and go to, skip to number C, which is on page 6. Here's where it gets more interesting. And we're going to start with Rav Moshe Feinstein and dealing with um, the issue about saving the life of a non Huron Shabbos, exactly this question that was raised. So I'm sorry, are you, are you, what's your name? Alejandra. Alejandra, did I say it right? Yes. Okay, Alejandra said, let's just assume everybody is Jewish. Okay, so that's what I would call, that's, we have a word for that, which is called a legal fiction, okay? <laughs> which is like, because so, sometimes it matters not what the law on the books is, but how you're going to choose to interpret the facts. So we're just going to choose to think, to assume everybody is Jewish. So that type of an approach is what Rav Moshe Feinstein does in a different way. Keep the law on the books, but based on a certain type of a workaround or a certain type of a way we assess a situation, effectively we're going to be able to treat non-Jews on Shabbos. So let's take a look at what he says. This is Rav Moshe Feinstein, the great Aleph authority who, of the previous generation. Um, and I'll give a little plug. I'm about to start release a podcast in about two weeks, which is going to be called Igris Moshe. That's the name of his responsa, A to Z, where each week we're going to do uh, three responsa of Rav Moshe Feinstein, 10 minutes at a time, three separate episodes a week. So each week it's focusing on a different theme. We're going to start with America, A to Z. Then we're going to do birth control, then conversion. So anyway, tune in for that if, you're, if you like this class. Thank you. <laughs> You'll hear a lot more of Rav Moshe Feinstein when we, if, in that podcast. <laughs> So let's see what he says here. Regarding non-Jews on Shabbat, it is clear that if he, the doctor, is in the hospital and refuses to aid a non-Jew for religious reasons, not only would this reason not be accepted, meaning to say, like, well, you know, I can't work, it's Shabbos, so A, they won't buy it, B, but if, the other, no other doc, but if there's no other doctor, they'll consider him negligent and a murderer. So if he is required to be on the hospital on Shabbat, see, there goes that point, I try to avoid being there, but if he can't avoid it, or if he has a practice, and although his office is closed on Shabbat, his patients come specifically to him, and a non-Jew comes to him with a matter of, of risk of to life, he is forced to take care of him, even if it entails, entails biblical desecration of the Sabbath. Now, how can he do it? Because otherwise, it would be a true danger to his own life from the relatives of the sick person. <laughs> and even if he is unconcerned that there will be any danger to him personally, we must be concerned that there will be a tremendous hatred from the people of the country and from the government itself. For we must definitely be concerned for the dangers that could result from this. And although Tosafot wonders how is it possible to allow Shabbat desecration because of concern for hatred, given the circumstances in our country nowadays, there exists from a, con a concern of hatred of great danger beyond what was considered. Even in democratic countries, where every Jew has the right to observe his own religion, However, this is not recognized to an extent a refusal to save a life. So, well, you can save the life of a non-Jew on Shabbos, because saving the life of a non-Jew is effectively what? Saving your own saving life. Saving the life, yeah, saving your own life. Saving the life of Jews. If not that they're going to attack the doctor and come and kill the doctor, <laughs> it'll lead to a pogrom, it'll lead to a big thing. Now, you know, there was things, I mean, there, we, like, what was the case with Yassi? Remember, remember this? There was a whole thing about in, in Crown Heights, 20 years ago, longer, about a case where uh, there was an issue about how they, they, they thought that Hatzalo wasn't saving a non-Jew, and it actually did lead to some type of a whole reaction. Anyway, but it, see, this is what I would call a legal fiction, okay? That we are going to assume that every case is actually really the risk of a life of a Jew. In all other areas of halacha, this is so far-fetched and abstract that it would not weigh. Okay, but here it's coming into play in a way to actually address this issue of save, because you got to save the life of a non-Jew. And I think that that's clearly what is motivating Rav Moshe, not from a sober, dispassionate analysis that really Jewish lives are at risk. Um, now, I have to tell you, you know, Rav Moshe went out of his way to say, like, as we've seen, even if you think that you're, there's no danger at all, doesn't matter, I'm telling you there's a danger, et cetera, et cetera. 
So what has happened is, and I've mentioned Hatzalah before. People know Hatzalah, right? The emergency ambulance service or whatever. So they do amazing, amazing work. So they, following this ruling of Rav Moshe Feinstein, they answer calls regardless, Jewish or non-Jewish, on Shabbos, you know, and give equal treatment. However, there's a little bit of a problem because since it's based on this type of a logic, and even though Rav Moshe made a point of saying that there's, you know, there's always going to be a danger, you should always assume, you know, etc., um, there have been stories that every now and then they've hesitated uh, to respond if they thought like they could get away without responding, you know, and nobody would know any better or something like that. You know, thankfully those stories are few and far between. I think I heard them about a one particular Hatzalah. You know, the, gl- the general rule is, you know, they, they respond equally without hesitation. But, you know, sometimes workarounds aren't perfect because workarounds leave the distinctions on the book. You know, and therefore it allows sometimes for something to slip between the cracks. Okay, but this ruling of Rav Moshe is very powerful. And I want to say something about workarounds. You know, to some degree we would pref- you know, prefer uh, an answer which is like, what do you mean? You save the life of non Jew because non Jewish lives are human lives. And of course, you know, that overrides job. It doesn't matter Jewish or non Jewish. So we'll see somebody who says that in a few minutes. Um, what Rav Moshe did by doing a workaround. It's more easily accepted by, by you know, one's colleagues because you're not making a radical change. Law by its nature, and halacha in particular, you know, religious law, but law by its nature is very conservative. You know, you know, it, it resists radical change. It moves slowly. Um, and therefore, it's much easier to keep the law on the books and to make some type of halachic fiction or workaround than to say we're going to revise the whole law. So the benefit is that it gets ex- accepted. You know, if you ask somebody, why, do you, why, why is it okay to save the life of a non on Shabbos? They'll say, oh, because Rav Moshe Feinstein said, et cetera, et cetera. Right? They won't say, oh, we've changed that law. You know, <laughs> right? Who's going to listen to you sure. say that? The downside is, is that because that law is left on the books, you know, the distinction is still present, and it can lead to some, sometimes some issues, like I mentioned. Um, um, the, uh, the, the, the law professor I was referring to before, her name, uh, her name was something in my mind, it's Suzanne Stone. She's a law professor in uh, Cardoza Law School. Um, so um, she actually said that there's a t- term for this in, in American law. I don't know if it's an official term. Anyway, it's called muddling through. Okay, and muddling through. <laughs> that's the official term. Muddling actually, through. Right? Actually, that's in British law. Is it? Okay. <laughs> right. There you go. And, and I mean, she tells a story that uh, when she was first, like, out, I think she was clerking for judge or whatever it was, a case came before her about some women that were being, like, you know, uh, taken to court by the IRS because of back taxes. And the story was, was that it was their husbands. Who didn't who, who who didn't pay taxes, and then the husbands like uh, gambled away all of the money, and they didn't have the money to pay it, but they were being held responsible because you know who knows where the husbands were, and legally they were responsible. I, I'm not remembering the specifics, but that was the gist. Anyway, so you know she went to the judge and she said like, look, I mean obviously this whole fact that they're being held responsible is like you know is is unjust, and we got to do something to change the law. And he said, well, we, we, we can't do that here. Figure out a way to get, to get there without changing the law. So anyway, so she sort of, she, she spent a lot of time, and then she realized, wait, like, you know, if they gambled away the money, then we could consider that a business loss or something like that, <laughs> that, that therefore count that against the money they owed in their taxes, so they really showed no. Anyway, there's some way she managed ultimately to get it that they didn't have to pay. And she said that, you know, some, the law works this way. Like, it, it first changes the practice of the law by these workarounds. And once the practice has changed enough in the real world so that now we all know what the norms of practice are, right, then it's easier for the law to catch up. It's easier for the law to shift once the foundation of practice has already been laid. So now that like all of these Hatzalah, you know, ambulances are equally answering calls to non-Jews on Shabbat, it doesn't really matter what the halachic justification is. You know, this has been going on for 20, 30 years, so now somebody comes and says, oh, you know, I'm going to rule like a certain authority, we haven't seen it yet, that actually says that um, nowadays you're, you save the lives of non on Shabbat. There will be a much more receptive ground for that because of the practice that's already been put in place by this workaround type of a position. So that is one way of dealing with it, which is these types of legal fictions and workarounds. The other approach of dealing with it is what I've been sort of alluding to, which is actually to be saying that 
you know what I said a while ago, which is that when we went through this whole process of self-censoring and saying, oh, all those Talmudic passages are all referring to those ancient pagans, they don't refer to non-Jews nowadays. Well, there are some halachic authorities that actually say, yes, that is correct. Meaning we're not just doing it as an act of self-censoring. We are going to interpret all of these things which seem to us so like ethically problematic, and we're going to say they were only meant when you were dealing with non-Jews that were not law-abiding citizens. You know, and, um, and in those circumstances, now that might be a bit of a fiction too, to pr- pr- assume that in the past all the non-Jews they were talking about weren't law-abiding. But by saying that, it's saying that's why it was acceptable to say those things. That's why those things made sense. If they weren't law-abiding and they didn't respect our persons and property, we didn't have to respect their persons and property. But now that they are law-abiding, we're dealing with a different type of non-Jew. So of course we have to, you know, keep the these laws vis-a-vis them. Yes. Okay, so there's this um, issue with prisons okay. right, and health care, uh-huh. and there's not very good health care for people who are incarcerated, Right. and many of those people were falsely incarcerated or incarcerated because of drugs or right. incarcerated because of whatever, whatever, um, or they're being incarcerated because they come and seeking asylum. I mean, I'm not sure when that's supposed to be happening, right? So there's that happening. Um, and then they're supposed to seek health care. So if they get sick or are dying on Shabbos, and these are not law-abiding citizens. Mm. I see. <laughs> so what, I mean, right. what, so you're right. what kind of marriage right. are we dealing with here, right? <laughs> so this, is, this, right. this can't happen. So, so what I will say, it's a good question. <laughs> what you. I will say is, what I will say is, is that the, I think what the response would be is we're talking about a class of people. We're not talking about individuals. Okay, so if we view the, the entire non-Jewish society as people that don't respect life and property of others, or per, maybe particularly our life and property, mm-hmm. then we don't have to respect theirs. But if we view the large society, the whole class of non-Jews, right, as people that do respect life and property, then that requires us to, you know, respect their life and property. So I think that the answer is that you look at it in terms of a class, not in terms of individual. But, you know, when you do these types of solving the problems by right. reframing it, you know, yeah, you just have to deal sometimes with those messy parts. Because there are entire classes of people that are actually law-abiding and are incarcerated falsely. Right. And by this understanding, we right. can't save them. Right. Well, you can go back to your halachic fiction and just say, I'm going to assume everybody here is law-abiding. That's law-abiding-y. exactly what I was talking <laughs> right. about. I'm like, right. why right. still right. You, you But I'm not sure we need to, because I think this approach <laughs> is like the class. How we think of non-Jews generally, not mm-hmm. not a specific individual. Yeah, right. but who who among us is completely law-abiding? Anyway? Right. Yeah, no. I mean, who has never rolled through a stop sign? <laughs> right. Everyone's a criminal. Right. Yeah. Right. right. I think it means a general orientation. Is society yeah, basically course, about yeah. respecting other people's, right. you know, lives and property, or not about that? Okay. So let's take a well, look. Yes. Go ahead. Guess what? So you, you talked about a, you know a, a more modern ruling coming out, right? And you may have implied. <laughs> That means we've now taken the old law off the books. Did I understand that right? I mean, how no, do we take we, it? I mean, there are certain 613 laws we are not no. going to take no, off. No, 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 no. I how, mean, do you take a law off the books? No, so it's never taken off the books. I mean, uh, you know, maybe I was sort of saying that, you know, like I was something like that contrasted to the way Rav Moshe was saying it, but it's not taken off the books, but its scope is narrow. Okay. okay. Meaning, okay, so that's, that's, that's no, the no, I appreciate you. I appreciate you raising it because I might have talked a little too, you know, glibly or whatever, a little too imprecisely. Um, you know, Rav Moshe says, oh, it, the law of not saving life applies to all non-Jews. It's just that it's always a Jewish life at stake. Whereas what this is saying is, the law is on the books, it just applies to a very particular class of people who don't exist nowadays. So effectively, it doesn't apply to anyone, but, you know, but it does it through narrowing the scope. So thank you for that clarification. So let's take a look. First, we'll see this in Rambam, who says it in one area, and then we'll see it in Meiri, who Rambam is 12th century Spain, Meiri is 13th century Provence. Meiri is the one who is most known for this approach. So source number 18, Rambam says the following. If an ox owned by a Jew gored an ox owned by a non-Jew, whether tame or habituated, you know, whether it usually gores or doesn't, he's exempt because you, know, you don't have to pay a non-Jew if your ox gored his ox. Why? So the Gemara doesn't say why. The Gemara just makes it sound like because they're non-Jews. But here's what Rambam says. Because non-Jews do not obligate people to pay for the damages that result from their animals. 
and we apply their laws to them. So if they're not going to obligate people to pay when their animals damage, we're not going to pay them when our animals damage them. So Rambam is sort of already, you know, giving this as a way of explaining the lack of, you know, symmetry of, or making it symmetry, but the lack of the way, you know, the way we treat Jews different than non-Jews has to do with the way they treat us. Um, let's take a look at the next source, the Meiri, who makes a more global statement. Okay, and Meiri, as I said, was 13th century Provence, and he came from somebody before, before I mentioned the whole issue about chosen people. You know, Meiri had an interesting theological philosophy, and he he thought that uh, two, two things. Number one is he thought that the only way that people are going to be, he did not believe in um, like a secular ethics. He said the only way people will live a moral life is if they believe in a, God, in a moral God, and that's, that, that'll keep them in line. Okay, That's point number one. So he didn't give any stock to a secular ethics. But he said, everybody who believes in a moral God uh, shares a fundamental community of faith. So, you know, Jews and non-Jews and Christians or whatever. So, meaning, obviously, he obviously held of the distinctions between Jews and non-Jews, but he's recognized a certain larger brotherhood of those who believed in a transcendent moral God. And because of that, he said that, um, that all these laws in the Talmud that allow, you know, unethical behavior towards non-Jews, he said those were referring to pagans like we said before, you know, the star worshippers. But here's why specifically pagans. Because, you know, one thing we know about, like, you know, if you think about, like, the Greek gods and so on, is that they were amoral. Not immoral, but amoral, right? They did not represent, you know, a fundamental ethical <clears throat> code. They acted with just as much passion and violence or whatever as human beings. So therefore, he said, regardless of how people actually practice their lives, it was not a society that was based on morality. So now, you know, again, it's, it's, he's, this is like the way he's framing the past that allows him to make this distinction. He says, nowadays, you know, even though, you know, Christians were involved in, you know, the Crusades, that wasn't in Provence, but he was aware of that, since we all believe in a transcendent God, that, you know, moral God, so then we all are living on a, on a society that is based in real morality. And therefore, we are obligated to, you know, treat everybody, Jew or non-Jew, according to a, the same ethical code. So similar to the things we've been saying, but it's based on a certain type of a religious philosophy. So let's read that inside, okay? Here's what he says in source number 19. He says, But regarding anyone from the nations who are constrained by ways of religion, so that's a key frame, constrained, meaning living a life that's not totally free, or living a moral life, due to your religious beliefs, constrained by ways of religion and worships the deity in any fashion. So in any fashion, I don't care if you're Jewish or not Jewish, okay, These, this is the key. You believe in God and you live a life of morality based on that. Although their faith is distant from our faith and are not included in this category, the category meaning that about like whether you're allowed to steal from them or cheat from them, but they are rather like full Jews for these laws, meaning we treat them equally as we treat Jews, even regarding lost objects and mistakes in transactions without any distinction. So that sounds like really modern, right? Like we cannot make any distinctions. Now, some people have said, oh, okay, but what about like Hindus, you know, who don't believe maybe in a transcendent God? You know, do we just focus on the morality point or do we focus on, do we have to buy into his whole theology? But here he basically does a way of saying, you know, it only applies to the past when it was a different type of society. Nowadays, these laws do not apply. So again, to sort of respond before, he narrows the scope and makes it relevant only to the past. Uh, here's another one that I just have to quote because, A, it speaks again to this philosophy and it goes even further than one might have imagined. He says, all who are constrained in the ways of religion are in the category of forbidden business cheating. That's what we discussed before, overcharging. But idol worshippers are not included in the brotherhood, so they, should be, so, they should be, so they should be included in the prohibition. Did I respond that? Um, oh, they're not included in the brotherhood that they should be included in the prohibition of business, meaning, meaning you're allowed to cheat them and, because they're not in part of this brotherhood. Anyway, our sages made the general statements, thou shalt not cheat one man his fellow, 
One who is with you in Torah and mitzvot, you shall not heed him. So let me explain what he's saying here. I, I realize my translation is not so uh, clear. What he's saying is the following. The Gemara says that the same way you're allowed to, there's no prohibition against overcharging. I mean, I'm embarrassed, uh, embarrassed whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's challenging to say this. The Gemara says the same way there's no prohibition of overcharging um, a non-Jew, there's no prohibition of um, of of overcharging a Jew who is not fundamentally committed to uh, a life, to like uh, the observance of mitzvot. Because it says, here they choose to read the phrase, your brother, not just means your fellow Jew, but somebody who shares with you the commitment to a life of mitzvot. So, Meir, so what Meiri says is the following. If you have an observant non-Jew, a Christian who keeps the tenets of his faith, they are considered to be in this brotherhood of keeping up, you know, with you in Torah and mitzvahs. Not literally Torah and mitzvahs, but meaning somebody who treats their faith seriously and as a result lives a moral life. And that type of a person, you, have an oblig- you are not allowed to cheat. And whereas your fellow Jew, who's not committed to such a life, you are allowed to cheat. So this is like really a radical refiguring of this. Anyway, that might have been a little te- too technical and complicated. I'm sorry if I went off on a bit of a tangent. But what I want you to hear is, is that not only is he just saying solving a problem. Oh, okay, mm-hmm. we'll say apply to the past and nowadays, you know, we have to treat them equally. He really has a deep philosophy here about a society based on, you know, sort of a morality, uh, based on a moral foundation for him, or a religious moral foundation. Yes, This question. is limited to these areas, because if he lived in Provence in the 13th century, of right. course he must have been involved with money lenders. Right. Mm-hmm. So then this must not have... Well, so again, the, the issue about thing. money lending is not an act of immorality, uh, uh, it's not an unethical act. That's just an act of but not having to give equal tzedakah to... But in the non-Jews. Torah, it says, to your brother, you should not lend with interest. Yeah, so he basically, he still, again, would speak about inner circles and broader circles, you know? So the highest obligation in terms of these acts of giving of our funds and of our time, that's to the more inner circle. But basic issues about ethical treatment, that applies, you know, to the sort of the broader circle. Yeah? I don't understand the, uh, this... Um, uh, defamation, uh, because, for example, the Knights Templar were charging uh, interest right. under the authority of, you know, uh-huh. so um, they were allowed to do it. Right. They, so, they were uh, Jewish. Yeah. Yeah. Knights Templar were, were Christian. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, they should have gotten. This, I mean, if all fair, and, <laughs> right. you know, that should be pointed out. That, yeah. Um, if, um, right. Well, in general, I, I don't see the interest as, a, as an issue, as we, met, we okay. mentioned that earlier. Okay, so what I want to do, so we have a little bit of time left, and um, I want to look at just one or two more sources that are along this line, okay? Um, and the rest are variations of this theme, the basic idea that, you know, nowadays non-Jews are not idolaters, nowadays non-Jews are ethical, and therefore these laws were only meant to apply to this past category of non-Jews. So they're all variations of that theme, but I want to read some texts that are particularly powerful in that regard. So let's look at source number 23. Okay, this is called the Be'er Hagola. This is from Rabbi Moshe Ravkash, who lived, as you see in the dates here, it says... Uh, I think that should be 1591 to, one, to 1671. Put the dash in that place. Anyway, lived in the 17th century. And here's what he says. He first quotes the Shulchan Aruch. And he says, Non-Jews whom we are not at war with, we do not bring about their death, but it remains forbidden to save them. Okay, that's this issue about even saving them on a Wednesday. Okay, so now here's what he has to say about this. That is to say that we are taught at the end of Kiddushin, the best among non-Jews you should kill. Here's one of these really challenging and problematic Gemaras, that is only if we are at war with them, as Tosis wrote in the name of Yerushalmi, that the rabbis did not say such a thing except with regard to the non-Jews of their time, who were pagans and that can be star worshippers. Oh my God, i got to proofread this text. Okay, anyway, and star worshippers. And star worshippers, and did not believe in the exodus or in creation. However, the non-Jews that we, the Jewish nation, are exiled in their shade, and scattered among them, their shade meaning that they provide for us protection, okay? Um, They do believe in creation and in the exodus, 
and in a number of core principles of faith, and their entire religious worship is towards the creator of heaven and earth. So it's very, you know, like refreshing to read this statement about the like major things that we share with our Christian. I don't know if he was thinking about Muslims, but it's equally true about Muslims. You know, with Christians and Muslims, we all believe in a creator. We all believe, you know, in creation and Exodus. We serve a God. And some people say, well, you know, the Christian God, Trinity, or whatever. Like, look, he's saying there's some basic core things here that we all share. Um, such the decisive, so the decisive have written and is quoted in the Ramah, for such non-Jews, it is not just the case that there is no prohibition <coughs> against saving them, but rather we are obligated to pray for their well-being, as the author of Masa Hashem has discussed at length in the Haggadah on the verse, pour out your wrath on the non-Jews who, knew you, who know you not. This is actually quite funny, because, you know, I don't know, when people get to the Haggadah, you know, the part about the, uh, the coast of Eliyahu, and you read the line in the Haggadah, it says, Shvo Hamas Ha'el Haggadah. Pour out your wrath against the nations. Now, that probably the reason we have that in the Haggadah, I mean, the Haggadah is the whole story about, you know, the plagues against the Egyptians and so on, so it might have been, you know, an opportunity to, like, release pent-up, you know, sort of Jewish feeling about having been, you know, being oppressed by their non-Jewish neighbors. So it's like, eventually God is going to get you back for all the oppressions, like he got back, you know, the, uh, you know, like, like the Egyptians. Of course, you know, it's funny nowadays to say it when we have very nice relations with our non-Jewish neighbors. So the point he's making here is, is that the verse doesn't end, or the line doesn't end, pour out your wrath against the nations. It's, Shvo Hamaska El Hagoyim, Asher lo yidaucha. Pour out your wrath against the nations who know you not. Meaning, so those nations who don't recognize God, right? We're supposed to all, you know, now everybody recognizes, you know, God, at least in his time. You know, now, of course, there's a problem of secularism. But anyway, so now, of course, you know, we love all of our neighbors and we all recognize that we have a shared God. I know somebody who once told me, you know, that, he, that somebody was doing an interfaith uh, seder with, with running translation. So he got to, you know, the kosa, the, the cup of Elijah, and he opened up the door and he says, Shvo chamascha el hagoyim, love thy neighbor as thyself. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in how you translate it, right? <laughs> anyway... So anyway, so there is a nice text which again says things are different nowadays, Whoops. you know, and therefore the again I'm trying to understand one way or another these laws were meant about different non-Jews and when Jews lived in different circumstances. Okay, so um, I think that what I will end with is we'll end with the very last source, which is a letter from Red Cook, which says the same thing in a different way, and he says the following. The real, this source 27 on page 10. The real correct position is like the opinion of Meiri, that all the nations which are constrained by proper inter, interpersonal laws, notice by the way he drops the Meiri's theology, he doesn't say are constrained by ways of religion, are constrained by, by interpersonal laws, like a live a life based on ethics, you know, there's a basic ethical foundation to their lives, are to be considered in this like a ger toshav, a resident alien, all issues of human rights and responsibilities. And then he concedes that that's not the opinion of the majority of the decisors, but he says, look, the reality is, is that we have to push that idea that in all these areas of interpersonal ethics and morality and so on, if we're living in a different society than we lived in the past, and therefore we can sort of understand that these halachot were made for, the, for, you know, for, 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 the, for those realities of the past, and that the law would be different, you know, it was never intended for the realities of today. So I think that what we've seen here is, you know, really a couple of important points. Number one is, yes, there are distinctions in halacha. Some of them I don't think we have to be troubled with, the ones that have to do with, as I said, sort of more the good deeds. We have a limited amount of, of uh, resources and time and effort, and it's okay, I think, to prioritize those that are closest to us as long as we don't forget about the larger world. But there are real problems in terms of our sense, moral sensibilities nowadays around ones that seem to say it's okay in terms of stealing or not paying debts or even inflicting injury, not saving the life, and so on. And there are definitely halakhic decisors who aren't bothered by this, you know, but there are definitely some that are very, very, very deeply bothered by this um, and understand that, again, part of the role of a 
of, a, of, of our responsibility in terms of the oral tradition is to understand the deep values of the Torah and to realize them in the way that we give rulings in the halakha and maintaining with, you know, keeping to the fidelity of the text and the tradition, and that they actually see that they have to find a way to be closing this gap, that that's what their role as post requires them. And we have found different ways. One way is to speak about certain um, Torah, an obligation in terms of Torah principles, if not technical halacha, the principle of darche shalom, of ways of peace, that could be understood as a type of, what we said, enlightened self-interest, but I would think more properly should be understood as a type of reciprocity, a basic moral value, or even more, a sense that we all have a, live in a larger shared community, and we're all members of a larger shared community, and that creates a sense of responsibility that we have to one another. Um, so there's that aspect. And then as a matter of the specific technical aspects of the halacha, what we have really seen is a, two basic approaches. One is to keep the law full, I, I was about to do that again, to not, to, to not change the scope of the law, but to affect, make it move through some type of a workaround or a legal fiction. So Rav Moshe Feinstein, for example, saying that it's always about the li- you know, it's the lives of Jews that are at risk in these types of circumstances, although we pointed out sometimes the cost that comes with that. Um, and then the other approach, which is really to narrow the scope and to say, and what the, the benefit of narrowing the scope is, is that it also, in a certain level, grapples with the deep ethical problem, which is how could such a law have been on the books in the first place? And what this answer says is, is because they were living in different times. You know, I started by saying that they were living as an oppressed minority, they were living in a hostile society, they were living in times where there was a certain understanding of and perception of what the non-Jews were, and that's what then, it's in those contexts that that's where these laws were meant, and when th- those realities are different, then these then those laws would not apply, and that is definitely where some major halachic authorities, you know, the positions that they hold um, in terms of these issues. Yes. So conversely, are you painting your ro- rose-colored lens of your interpretation on the text yes. through, you know, your paradigm of thought? I I, I don't understand the question. Well. You know, you, you made several references that I didn't want to interrupt. You know, of, of the Torah, and, you know, the God of War. I, I mean, the, the, there's many different things, you know, the Torah. Oh, you mean when a posik basically says, what do I think is the deep morality of the Torah, why do they choose certain values over other values? Is that what you're asking? Or even your whole lecture is painting in, in a certain lens of the current modern context of, of looking at, at, at the text. Well, I, I, I am focusing on those post schemes that are bringing this sort of moral sensibility to their halachic ruling. And so, yeah, that's because that's what's interesting. I mean, the other post schemes that are just sort of not sort of doing anything with the text and keeping it the way it is. Um, but I, I'm acknowledging that. I mean, we read before, you know, about Rav Avad Yosef. I've been acknowledging all along that you know, there are many post schemes that are happy with the law as it is and don't see a need to change it. Um, but yes, I personally, of course, do side with those that um, do see a responsibility to close the gap. So that is correct. Yeah. In the narrowed scope, are there situations today where we could actually then find some validity for us with groups that are very hateful? Yeah, so I will say, so that's that a good are, question. You know, yeah. I will say that, um, look, I'm not, let me just sort of say this, that I, that I have heard, I'm not going to make a claim to what he would say if he were here and what his position is right now, but I have heard in the past Rabbi Shlomo Riskin talk about the Meiri's position and about societies based on morality and so on, and has said that even though Islam is more, you know, doesn't have the issues of the Trinity and is, you know, rejects images and so on, so sort of at a theological level is closer, you know, much closer to our faith, um, that he thinks that, you know, because of radical Islam and the way that other, you know, other Islamic, you know, uh, uh, leaders do not denounce it and so on, that some of what was said before about, you know, about these distinctions should apply to, to Muslims. Now, 
you know, I think that that is way globalizing what happens in radical Islam to the entire billion Muslims that are in this world. But um, but anyway, but if you're asking, are there some who want to Within maintain these distinctions, maintain these distinctions with certain classes of people? The answer is yes. There are some who who want to sort of say, we'll remove these distinctions for for you know for some, and we'll apply them to others. So yeah, that definitely is his position. So and there are some who say that. Well, I was just trying to give it a rational, moral upstanding for us today to uh-huh. have some value. Right, like, is there something we can salvage from this text? Right. So I think that's an interesting, like, in the sense of, are we comfortable still applying these distinctions, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to certain groups of people? So I, 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 it's a really hard question, you know, because, I mean, I, I would, I, I'd ask you what you think. I mean, I feel that we have to pre- act, look, if somebody is acting towards us in a violent way and we have to protect our lives or whatever, then there are different halachas that apply. You know, that's about protection of our life, protection of other people's lives, you know, somebody who has a category of rodef, who is a threat to life, and so on. So there, you know, those are, those are special cases. But generally, whether somebody's a good person or not a good person, I think we have to treat everybody with a basic, you know, that there's basic codes of morality we have to treat all human beings with. So it's, a, it's an important question. Yeah. My takeaway here is, with the exception of Rabbi Feinstein and some of the um, rabbis that try to adopt a more modern explanation, at the end of the day, we're still talking about workarounds and trying to explain right. halacha and instead <clears throat> of facing the issue that we should look at some of these texts from a historical mm-hmm. point of view right. and say this is the way right. we were taught right. but maybe understand in this modern century, these principles can't be applied. Because if you give this text to any anti-Semite, what better ammunition could you give them than having this uh, chapter in And that goes about when the Talmud was translated and the the church was told what was in it. There was opposition to translating it into English for exactly that reason. Now you can get it all online, you know? And the last point is this line of thought yeah. is continuing just in the last few months in the state of Israel where they passed this right. national state law. So, so where I know they're I making, again, yeah, distinct black and mm-hmm. white yeah. distinction between Jew and non-Jew. So I don't want to comment on the current political situation, but what I will say about your previous comment is I think that the later positions, Rav Moshe Feinstein was a workaround, but then the ones afterwards really were grappling with the issue and really were saying, like, yes, this is a historical context, and that historical context doesn't apply nowadays. One one minute. So that's number one. But the other point I want to make is, like, halacha works through re through reinterpretation, not through revoking laws. And the best analog to think about this is the Constitution. So it's true that even the Constitution, you know, you can have an amendment and you actually can revoke parts of the Constitution, which is true. Um, but mostly, you know, uh, or not mostly, I mean, it's major things like slavery or whatever, <laughs> okay? But, um, but a lot of change has happened through the pro- through reinterpretation, you know. Some will say creative reinterpretation. It depends if you're a constructivist, what your position is. But that is the way that halacha deals with change, is not through revoking, but through reinterpreting. And I think that some have done that effectively in a way that puts it in a historical context, as you were referring to. But we're still teaching the new rabbinical students the same text, the same way. Well, that's, they taught that's them what I started with, and maybe this ago. is a good point to end, which is I think that you know, um, I'll, t- I'll, I'll end by telling you a story that I give a Daf Yomi class, which is, you know, a daily page of Talmud. And um, I was very blessed for many years to have in my class um, a woman by the name of Rivka Hout, Allah Shalom, who was a major um, uh, a feminist, a guna activist, 
wonderful, wonderful, deeply person. I mean, and you know, she kept me on my toes, <laughs> both because of like her strong moral sensibility. Also, anytime there was a Gemara that had anything to do about women or about animals, she loved her dog and she loved animals. I knew like I was gonna get it from her. So anyway, so I remember that once we were reading this Gemara and I was like trying to make it, soften it and explain it and make it better. And I, I remember to this day what she said, she said, Rabbi Linzer, it is not your responsibility to solve the problem of the text. What you have to do, and what you do do, is you have to acknowledge that it's a problem. Because the biggest issue is when it gets taught without being problematized, then everybody just internalizes that perspective without really any critical thought. And you know, and that's the issue. Yes. So acknowledge that it's a problem, name it, you know, and you don't always have to have an answer. So that's sort of what we started with. And I would agree. I think that you can teach these texts if you raise the problems. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the pro I think the, the, what where we when when we, we fail when we teach them and we don't have a whole discussion of how bad is it to kill a non-Jew and not at any one moment say, wait a minute. This is a whole, how can I even be talking like this, you know? So that's where the real problem lies. All right, it's been great learning with all of you. Thank 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 you.